Great. Well, um, the title of my paper is Muslim Commentary on Positive Quranic Verses about the Previous Scriptures. Um, this is drawn from a, a short section of uh, the book that Sam conveniently waved towards you previously uh, on a history of Muslim views of the Bible. I thought before I dip into a very particular section of it, I would just outline a little more broadly the nature of the book project, because I'm only part way through it at the moment and uh, set the scene, if you like, both for what I'm saying today, but perhaps also making some connections with other um, speakers who've already presented. So uh, this has turned into a, what I hope will be a two volume project. Volume one came out around the turn of the last year, uh, very late 2020, um, and covers the first four centuries of Islam. I'm just gonna change my view here, excuse me. <clears throat> my aim is to try and tell a story, if you like, uh, not my own story, but to uh, give a way of making, seeing the shape of Muslim responses and engagements with the biblical text. I can't possibly cite every relevant work, but my hope is to give a, a, a representative picture, which does give a sense of the arc, if you like, the development, the twists and turns, uh, to try to discern patterns, shifts, changes over the centuries. Um, I've stopped at the moment at the, the death date of Ibn Hazm, a famous severe critic of the Bible in 1064, hence the 64 CE, hence the time frame of the first four centuries. Uh, the second volume is try, seeking to bring things up to date. So in other words, from the 10 hundreds up to now, which might be even more madly ambitious, but we shall see what happens. Um, so just to give you a very brief outline, volume two, we'll look at first some, what you could call late classical Muslim works uh, up to around 14, 1500. There's a bit of overlap as you'll see in a minute. So this will include people like Al-Jili, whom, uh, whom Fitz talked about yesterday, and also Ibn Barrajan and Al-Biqai, who were operative in those early centuries, kind of between 1100 and 1500 CE. Uh, Quran commentary and various other works as well. Um, after that, I'm going to look at some particular places and uh, governing polities. So I'll look at um, the Ottoman Empire. Now, obviously, the Ottoman Empire begins before 1500. So I need to do some thinking about the, the margins of division there. Um, but yes, yeah, some Ottoman works. Um, the Safavid Empire, which is the, the Shi'i Empire, which uh, ruled Iran from 1501, the, the Safavids being those responsible actually for Shiism being the state religion, if I may use that phrase, in Iran. I'm also looking at the Malay Indonesian world, um, or as someone like Munim Siri might call it, the Indonesian Malay world, whichever you prefer. Um, and in, in each of these, also looking at the emergence of the Bible in, trans in relevant languages. Uh, not the whole story of the Bible in Malay or the Bible in Ottoman Turkish, but the emergence of it, at least. Um, looking at India and the Indian subcontinent, uh, including the 19th century. So looking at, interestingly, at Syed Ahmed Khan, about whom you've already heard some things today. And then moving on to the 20th and 21st centuries. So uh, 20th century, uh, interestingly, looking at Sam's work, Sam Ross's work on tafsir literature, amongst many other figures and features. Uh, and drawing to a close, hopefully, fairly near the present day. So looking at some instances of writing, even by people I know or, or who have attended some gatherings like this. Shabir Akhtar, who used to work with us here at CMCS Oxford, his work on the Book of Galatians from a Muslim point of view, uh, and various others. There are some interesting pieces coming out even in the last few years. So I hope to look at questions like, you know, what more recent works are drawing on ancient wells and perhaps sometimes really not changing anything, but what also has changed And the last paper by Sam in the last hour is a fascinating example, that use of a graph or a graphic to show the, the great, great increase uh, in tafsir literature and engagement with the Bible. You know, what has changed? And of course, the important question of why. Um, just on that, I hope Sam won't mind my uh, commenting on, on his work that he, he draws attention to. It isn't necessarily issues to do with um, 
legal rulings or other prohibitions that have limited engagement with the Bible so much perhaps as its sheer availability and accessibility both in relevant language and also because of uh, the spread of printing. So as he's drawn attention to there's much greater engagement with the Bible in the late 19th century onwards and another reason for that th this is his comment is obviously the greater presence of powerful western influence western influence often being seen as intertwined with christianity so there are there is availability and there's all, there are also reasons to understand what's being spread or thought uh, perhaps by christians um, obviously that context is very different you know the the looming presence and power of um, western uh, seen as christian powers in the, the 19th and into the 20th century very different context from shall we say the ottoman empire and Suleiman the magnificent when martin luther uh, the christian reformer was you know very uh, anxious about the apparently unstoppable military force of the ottomans so um, also reflecting on the, the changes in balances of power uh, along the way and that how that has affected engagement so that's what I'm hoping to sketch out. Um, and uh, obviously some of the soundings we've taken in this conference that feed into my, uh, my hopes to try and um, outline the overall picture. Okay, well, let me just begin to share screen. Right, I'm trusting uh, you can see that because I can see you, Fitz, could you just give me a thumbs up? Is that shared successfully? Great, thank you very much. Um, so, as we've said, a common concern, and it is a common concern in some Muslim writings, is about ideas of corruption of the Bible. Uh, in other words, uh, trying to explore what does this term or falsification mean? Does it mean corruption of the text or corruption of the interpretation, you know, that Christians, Jews and perhaps others are misinterpreting the Bible? And there's been quite a bit of writing about that, both amongst Muslims and non-Muslims. Uh, but today I'm, I'm choosing to look at a path somewhat less traveled, you could say. Um, the exegetical tradition on verses that seem to be more positive about the previous scriptures in some way. Now, the more positive verses are far more numerous in the Quran than the negative verses about corruption. Far more numerous. I've, I've listed all the relevant verses in an appendix at the back of my book. Um, but interestingly, there seems to be much less written on how Quran commentary regards these or regards the implications of these. So for the, the heart of this short paper, I'm going to look at three early commentators. And as I say, this is drawn from my uh, book. Um, firstly, the two of whom have already been mentioned, certainly by Munim Siri and I think one or two others. Muqatil bin Sulaiman, who died there in 150 or 767. I'll say a bit more about them in a moment. And then Abu Jafar Tabari, a very, very famous early commentator, partly because he draws together huge numbers of other exegetical traditions. And then thirdly, the, the first two of those are both Shia. Uh, Muqatil is interesting because his is regarded as the first complete commentary on the Quran. And from that date, 767 being about 130 uh, plus years after the death of Muhammad. And then the third figure here, Ali bin Ibrahim al-Qummi, who's an early Shia commentator. Uh, his, his dates aren't known exactly, but that gives you a rough idea. Um, so I'm going to look in a little bit of detail at what the three of them have to say about some of the positive verses. Um, I'm then going to add on uh, a little extra. Uh, one of the verses they look at is uh, Surah Yunus, Surah 10, verse 94. Uh, I'll bring this up on the screen later, which says, if you are in doubt, this is addressed to Muhammad, if you are in doubt about what we have sent down to you, ask those who have been reading or reciting the book before you. Uh, that's quite a well-known verse, which seems to have some kind of positive implication. So I'm going to take an unscientific sampling of some of the other more recent works, um, just looking at that one particular verse. 
um, when I say more recent, more recent than 1064, although we do get quite recent, just to be assured. Uh, I do come blinking out of the shade of the first four centuries of uh, Islamic history in, uh, into, the, into the light of more modern times as well. So that's roughly where we're going. Some discussion of these three, and then a little sounding on Surah 1094 in particular. So, Muqatil ibn Sulaiman. Excuse me, one moment. Best laid preparation. Muqatil was born in Balkh, uh, in present day northern Afghanistan, uh, and he died in Basra in southern Iraq. I'll come to these verses in a moment. As I've said, his importance lies in his. Um, being the first complete commentary that we're aware of. Uh, and his views inform a wide range of later exegetes, including at Tabari, um, who borrows from him without naming him. So I'll just draw on three trends I saw in some of Muqatil's discussion of what I'm calling positive verses. Firstly, narrowing the application. The first one here is on the screen. He narrows the application of verses which make apparently broad positive statements. Uh, so for example, Surah 5, Al-Ma'idah 43 to 48, this is the longest passage, um, the longest positive passage, a sustained passage of several verses uh, reflecting on the previous scriptures, however they might be understood. I I'm setting aside here the question of, are these Quran verses referring to the extant or canonical New Testament or Hebrew Bible scriptures or some other concept. Obviously, that's left undiscussed. Um, so here you have the Torah containing the judgment of God. So what does Muqatil make of this verse? Well, he states that this refers specifically to the issues of stoning for the married man and woman um, and to, for, for adultery and to retaliation for murder. So, and later in his commentary on these six verses, he refers to stoning and also the mission of Muhammad as the referent, and later stoning and the description of Muhammad. So you can see he's, he's when he's talking about the Torah, the Torah containing the judgment of God, he means on very particular points, not in general. At the close of his discussion, he turns to Surah 5, verse 47, which Munim Siri uh, talked about yesterday, which appeals to the people of the gospel to judge by what God has sent down in it. You see the verse on the screen there. Uh, now, again, this might seem like quite a broad ranging affirmation. Muqatil states that this refers specifically to judgment about forgiveness regarding a killer or someone who injures another or strikes someone. Similar comments are made in relation to 566, uh, while well, the exhortation to Jews and Christians in 568 to observe their scriptures is said to concern the matter of Muhammad. So again, he's narrowing the application. So his, he also talks about Surah 11, 17, the role of the Torah as a model and a mercy for those who believe in it. And he says that this refers to people who, the people of the Torah who also believe in the Quran. Moving on, his second theme, the first theme being narrowing of the application. His second theme is um, criticism of the people of the book. Excuse me, I just want to make myself able to see the time so I don't put this wrongly. Sharing screen obliterates the time on the screen. Criticism of the people of the book. So here's a, a very well-known verse about Surah, surah 2, 285, Al-Baqarah. States that every believer believes in God's books, plural, as well as his messengers and angels and so forth. This prompts Muqatil to comment that the people of the book are at fault for only believing in some of these books. Jews reject the Injil and the Quran. Christians reject the Quran, whereas Muslims accept all three, the Torah, the Torah, the Injil, 
and the Quran. And there are other examples we'll come to. So these verses which seem to include the previous scripture in the life of the faithful person here are, are used, this verse is used to say, yes, but just believing in those is not enough. Thirdly, and here we come to a, a use of 1094, defending the status of Muhammad. There's a third theme that comes out of his comments on positive verses. And here's the verse. If you are in doubt about what we have sent down to you, ask those who have been reciting the book before you. So Mukhatil writes that the people to ask, this is a common question that exegetes raise, um, what does it mean to say, ask those who have been reciting the book before you? Who are they? Mokartil comments that this means uh, people like Abdullah bin Salam, who was a famous early convert to Islam, a Jew who converted to Islam. So him and his companions, in other words, yes, yes, people of the book uh, in Quranic parlance, in this case, Jews, but those who have also come to accept Islam. By being specific in this way, Mukhatil diverts the interpretation away from a more general reference to the people of the book and towards an, exalta an exhortation to consult those who are now Muslims. Now, in a hadith, Muhammad's response to the encouragement to ask others if in doubt is, quote, I do not doubt and I do not ask, because another implication of this verse is that is, is Muhammad having doubts. Talk a bit more about that later. Um, and in a hadith, it's recorded that Muhammad's response is, I do, uh, in, content, in relation to this, I do not doubt and I do not ask. For those who wish to know that hadith is found, it's not found in any of the six canonical Sunni hadith collections, but it is found in uh, Abd al-Razaq al-Sanani's work, al-Musannaf. So for Muqatil, the phrase, if you are in doubt, is a rhetorical device to draw out a statement about lack of doubt in Muhammad. So to summarize, the three themes, as I said, Muqatil tends to limit the application of apparently broad affirmation of the previous scriptures. He criticizes the people of the book and he defends the status of Muhammad. I beg your pardon, I should have shown you that slide. And there's the, um, there is the uh, reference to the Hadith if anyone wants that, or I could send it to them later. <clears throat> so moving on to At-Tabari, who's a, a more famous figure that those of you involved in any way in Islamic studies will have come across. He was born in Tabaristan in present day northern Iran um, and died in Baghdad in uh, 923 CE, uh, Baghdad being the intellectual capital of the Islamic world at the time. So his commentary draws together, as I said, a huge number of different traditions and comes in many volumes. So Tabari's exegesis of Surah 2 verse 4 indicates his overall approach. The verse describes those who believe in what was sent down to you and what was sent down before you. Only those who believe in all the revelation are God-fearing. That is Tabari's approach again. So the pious, the God-fearing, are described as those who believe both in the revelation to Muhammad and what's come before. But for Tabari, he says, you're only God-fearing if you believe in the Quran as well. So that's his take on that. It's similar to Muqatil. Uh, when people are exhorted to have faith in the Torah, in the Injil, in other verses, and also what was sent down to them through Muhammad, the emphasis is on the importance of accepting all the revelation. I'll come to 546 in a moment. On 544, the Tabari includes several reports explaining the meaning of the exhortation to judge by what God sent down in the Torah, to the Torah. What was sent down can refer to the ordinances, the hudud of God, or again, to very specific issues to do with adultery and others. Um, Surah 544 terms those who do not judge by what God sent down in the previous scriptures as disbelievers. You know, so in other words, it seems to be emphasizing it's important. Um, what is the nature of their unbelief? 
One explanation given by Atobari is that this refers to Jews who corrupted the book of God and changed his judgment. Now here at 546, we see the gospel being described as guidance and light. And again, Munim touched on this. You know, what, is, what does it mean for the gospel to represent guidance and light according to the Quran? For Tabari, the Injil explains what the people are ignorant of. Uh, sorry, it, the Injil reveals to Jesus what was sent down before him from God, in particular regarding what is permitted or forbidden. So this is a concept of the gospel very much shaped in, uh, in Muslim form to do with prohibitions um, and permission. That's the nature of the guidance and light. I think Munim mentioned some different explanations of that guidance and light yesterday as well. I beg your pardon, I've, I've covered those already. So again, we move to um, Surah 1094, according to At-Tabari. Now, At-Tabari uh, has some other things to say on this. He raises the question of whether Muhammad could have been subject to doubt. Uh, I'll just give you the verse again there. If you are in doubt about what we have sent down to you, ask those who've been reciting the book before you. Uh, like Muqatil, Tabari cites various traditions, uh, interpreting the verses, encourage encouraging Muhammad to ask those from the people of the book who have also accepted Islam. He does also cite one tradition advising consulting the people of the book in general, not just those who believe in Muhammad. Now as to the issue of doubt, that Tabari cites traditions affirming that Muhammad did not doubt and did not ask questions of others, again similar to Mokata. Responding to the objection that the verse indicates the contrary, that Muhammad did doubt, that Tabari states that this is a form of address to Muhammad, which, to which the answer is obvious, along the lines of, if, as I've put on the screen here, if you are my son, then honour me. The implication being, well, it's obvious you are my son, so you should honour me. If you are my slave, then obey me. Um, in this, the answers are so obvious that it's not actually a real question, it's there for another purpose. So likewise here, real doubt is not in view. It's almost as if, say, if you were in doubt, but you're not. Now, Al-Qummi, he was born in the Persian city of Qom, uh, in Arabic, Qum. Uh, still an important center of Shi'i scholarship today. Uh, so his doubts, his dates are a bit uncertain, but they, they, they run from the kind of late 800s into the 900s CE. His commentary doesn't discuss every verse of the Quran, um, and I'll just touch on a few small examples here from what he does say. Uh, interestingly, on the longer passage, 543 to 48, he doesn't uh, make any comment, uh, very little to say on that. Here we see Surah 566, which talks about some of the people of the book being a moderate community. And again, Al-Qummi uh, cites this as those who have accepted Islam from amongst the people of the book. Uh, perhaps I'll just turn to 1094 because Al-Qummi has a very different understanding of this particular verse. Once again, there's the text about it being, if you are in doubt, ask those who've been reciting, reading or reciting the book before you. Now, Al-Qummi has a very different understanding of whom should be asked here. Uh, this is a, a verse addressed to Muhammad, and so he's interpreting in that context. Al-Qummi says, this is about asking the previous prophets for Muhammad to ask the previous prophets for reassurance when the greatness of Ali is revealed to him during his night journey. I'll just unpack that a little. So um, in Muslim understanding, the Muhammad experience is being taken to Jerusalem and then from Jerusalem up to heaven. Now, whether that's a visionary experience or also a physical experience is debated. That needn't concern us here. Um, but Al-Qummi's understanding is that when 
Muhammad sees the greatness of Ali uh, on, in his journey to heaven, um, this might cause this causes him to doubt his own standing as a prophet. So, Al, so Al Qummi therefore understands this as saying that if Muhammad then consults other previous prophets, he will gain reassurance from them that although Ali is so great, he Muhammad is also very important. Now, the Shia uh, have intense devotion to Ali. Ali, sorry, I should explain. Uh, being the fourth, in Sunni understanding, the fourth caliph after the death of Muhammad. In Shia understanding, he should have been the first, the legitimate, the first caliph. Um, Ali died in the 661 CE, so he actually became caliph about 25 years after the death of Muhammad. But the, the point here is that he is a greatly revered figure in Shiism. So interestingly, Al-Qummi uh, interprets this verse in, in a quite different way. Right. Um, so what I found as I looked into these passages, and as I said, um, it's, it's one of the areas in my book where is that, that there seems to be least written in, in terms of secondary scholarship on these positive, I and mean, there are other positive verses as well. I've just tried to pick out a few key texts. Um, let me move on from there to just mentioning a few more comments on Surah 1094. And as I say, this is an unscientific sampling, uh, not a systematic survey. Uh, so I'm in no position to give one of Sam's graphs as yet. Um, so here we have uh, Tafsir al-Jalalain, very famous, relatively short commentary uh, with the dates there. Uh, and the, the short comment on Surah 1094, um, is to repeat the hadith, I do not doubt and I do not ask. It's really quite a brief comment. Uh, we have here also a comment from Tafsir al Mana. I'm sorry, I haven't put the dates there. This was started by Muhammad Abdu, who Sam was mentioning as one of the modernist Salafis. He died in 1905. Uh, a lot of the work was actually completed by Rashid Rida, who's also been mentioned earlier who was, if you like, the, the disciple or the, and the associate of Muhammad Abdu. So actually this discussion, um, the discussion in Tafsir al-Mana, which means the lighthouse or beacon, um, was actually written by Rashid Rida. And he says, uh, he, he quotes the, the question about, uh, I do not doubt and I do not ask, the statement from the Hadith. He also, and also says, uh, ask those who recite the books of the prophets, but he says, some Mufassirun, some commentators, this is Rashid Rida here, says that the meaning of asking is to ask people who'd accepted Islam, like Abdullah bin Salam from among Jewish scholars and Tamim at Dari from among Christian scholars. So here, yeah, a Christian and a Jew who had accepted Islam, they could be asked. Just move on to perhaps a slightly lesser known figure in some circles. Haji Abdul Malik Karim Amrullah, who is known as Hamka because of the initials of each of those names. He adopted this as a, a pen name. And he, he was a very prolific Indonesian writer of, in fact, uh, fictional works as well as uh, a large tafsir in, in, written in Indonesian. And you see there he died in uh, 10, eh, sorry, in 1981. So he's a 20th century figure, Hamka. Now, uh, he uh, quotes quite a bit on 1094 that is traditional, but he also uh, comments, and I, I haven't traced this back yet. So as I said, this is unscientific. Sam may well be able to comment on this. Uh, he uh, questions what's found in Tafsir al-Mana, by uh, Rashid Rida, uh, the comment about Abdullah bin Salam and Tamim at Dari being reliable people to, to, to consult. Um, his Hamka's comment is that because the surah is traditionally understood as being Meccan, in other words, it was sent down to Muhammad during the Meccan earlier phase of his prophethood, um, these individuals, Abdullah bin Salam and Tamim at Dari, had not yet converted, and therefore he's not persuaded by that explanation as to whom Muhammad should be asking. Very briefly, Sayyid Qutb the famous uh, Egyptian 
who died in 1966, uh, one of the driving forces behind the Muslim Brotherhood, in his commentary on In the Shade, uh, called In the Shade of the Quran. Uh, his comment is very brief and very much in order to assert that Muhammad did not doubt. Uh, my final comment is something a little bit different. This is a, a chapter by Walid Saleh, who's a contemporary scholar who's done a lot of work on al-Biqai. Um, uh, here's a, a chapter by him called End of Hope, Surahs 10 to 15, Despair and a Way Out of Mecca. And for those of you who are interested, this is in a, a volume called Quranic Studies Today from 2016. And I only mention this because his whole chapter is about how Muhammad did doubt. So he takes quite a different line uh, and he has quite a detailed discussion of surahs 10 to 15 and what is going on there. Now, I needn't dwell on this. You may have noticed by now that actually there seems to be uh, no reflection on any implication about the previous scriptures in surah 1094. This was my um, somewhat negative finding from my unscientific sampling, um, is that I haven't yet actually found discussion of that verse which draws in what this might say uh, about the, the previous scriptures as such. Um, so although that might seem a somewhat unsatisfying, it, it's a conclusion of a kind, I suppose you could say, um, even if a, an apparently negative one, but I haven't thoroughly researched that yet. So I think at that point I might pause um, having taken you through some early works and then a very brief whistle-stop tour of one or two more recent ones um, to take a uh, question. So I'll stop sharing at that point. And again, if you could write questions in the chat or reflections, um, I'm happy to try, at least try to answer them. No promises. Yeah. Feel free to take a moment if you want to write something or digest all of that. Perhaps just while you're doing that, I just should just say this, this might seem a rather uh, negative perspective on positive verses, but uh, I went into this not really knowing what I would find. And certainly in the, in the early period, that's, those seem to be the themes that, that came out. Uh, but I shall be interested to see in what ways that continues or varies uh, in the material I'm yet to be looking at. Well, it looks like I've answered every conceivable question on this particular area, which uh, I doubt is true. Ah, here we are. Here's one. Uh, yes, the main topic of tahrif seems to have been missed, uh, whether it was the corruption of the text or the corruption of meaning. Um, well, I could comment on that briefly, but yes, I mean, that the reason being that I was not looking at that topic. I was actually looking at um, verses that don't discuss that theme. Which are, which are far more numerous. Um, I mean, that the history of, of the term tahrif and how it's understood is, is long and complex. Um, a brief comment on that would be that it's, it's not universally understood as textual corruption in the early centuries, by no means. Uh, one perhaps random example in Hadith literature, there's, there seems to be almost, almost and there are a few, but almost nothing, very few Hadiths that um, indicate textual corruption uh, of the previous scriptures as far as one can gather. Uh, but that I was really not dealing with that topic because I was going deliberately in another direction. Um, uh, there's one question here about the commentary of Muhammad Shahrua, but I, I for one haven't engaged with that as yet, so I can't really comment on that. Um, Salman is, is holding it up. Yes. Um, thank you. Yeah. 
Any other questions? I'm happy to give time, but if not, we could, ah, Salman is uh, raising a hand. Do you, do you want to type to everyone? Could you, could you type your question, Salman, or do you need unmuted? Yes. Oh, thank you, Abdullah. I sent that message to you by mistake rather than to everybody. Is there a parallel between the idea of limiting the meaning of Torah and the idea of limiting the meaning of those who have the previous scriptures? Um, I'm wondering if I fully understood that. Do you mean those who have the previous scriptures being taken as a reference to those who have the scriptures and have also accepted Islam? On the one hand, you mean? So limiting the definition of the people group and limiting the meaning of Torah. Uh, in, in what way limiting the meaning of Torah? Sorry, I'm, I may be being slow here. Well, you're muted, Ida, sorry. It, it just seemed that um, the, the Torah was being narrowed down to specific judgments within the Torah. Ah, I see what you mean. And, sorry, yes, yes, yes. And, and yeah. The, um, the people who have the book before is limited to the people who have become Muslims. Yeah, so I'm sure. wondering whether there's a pattern here of taking the previous scriptures and limiting the way that you in, interpret them. And the, this, mm. this is an underlying pattern that's playing out in different mm. directions. I think, I think the primary limiting to do with the Torah is the limiting of the... the um, coverage of what the Quran verse is referring to, if that makes sense. So when the Quran is saying, judge by the, the Torah or uh, so on, then it's, you know, what, what does the Quran mean by that? I think perhaps it's only secondary. It's, it's not so much saying, you know, the Torah really only equals these rulings, um, but it's referring to what the Quran verse has in view. Does that make sense? Um, but yes, you could say there's a general limiting going on in terms of wanting to stay within a certain framework, perhaps, you know, whether that's who are we talking about or what are we talking about, if that answers your question. Yeah. Um, there's another question here. Let me just read it. This has been a wonderful lecture, but no solution. Um, I, did, I need a moment just to read this. Articles in the Encyclopedia of Islam seem to conclude that Injil Taurah, Nas Yahud Nasara, that's Jews and Christians, have two meanings in the Quran the original revelations and communities and present codices and communities. Um, any comments on this? Uh, yes, there's certainly a dynamic going on at times of <clears throat> um, affirmation being about um, an original community or text, and but that original community or text having, or particularly the community having perhaps made wrong choices so that you know, historic communities of Jews and Christians in the seventh century CE aren't necess can't necessarily be mapped onto uh, Quranic or other references um, to Jews and Christians. Now, again, I, I suspect that commentators uh, vary. Well, I, I know some of them do. Uh, I think Sam is back in the room, so I don't. Perhaps I could just invite Sam Ross to, to comment on that as well. This idea of uh, original and then subsequent versions of, of communities or text. Sam, are, are you there? Let me just check my screen. Maybe he's not quite with us at the moment. Anyway, that, that would be my comment. But yes, that is, that is quite a common uh, dynamic at play. Um, having said that, some Muslims, I mean, including uh, people like Ibn Taymiyyah, who who's um oh sam needs readmitting someone like ibn taymiyyah whom sam mentioned who's uh, often known for his very strong views um has a, has a, a surprisingly positive at least theoretical view of the previous scriptures and that includes his saying well there must have been versions around in, in the seventh century the rise of islam which uh, which are like the ones we have today but they're perhaps were other versions as well. Um, Abdullah Saeed, who's a modern 
a Muslim writer on these things, he more strongly affirms, well, what the Quran must be talking about is the same as the extant, text, extant texts we have now, because that's what was in circulation in the seventh century as well. Um, so, so he would not, Abdullah Said would not be so keen on distinguishing, you know, what the Quran is talking about is something really quite different from the extant, let's for example, New Testament. Um, but, but many would not, many Muslims would not take that view. Um, um, another question here, would it be helpful to distinguish Al-Yahud, the Jews, and those who Judaized while discussing the question of tahrif. Um, I think I'd need to know slightly more about what that meant. Uh, I think I need to pause on that, but do elaborate, uh, Tayyib, if you wish. Any other questions or comments? Perhaps not. Well, I don't want to be too hasty to cut people off, but I don't, also don't want to linger too long. <clears throat> um, perhaps at this point, I should say thank you very much to our other speakers as well, some of whom are, are with us. And I suggest we take a break as scheduled and then reconvene at quarter past the hour. And we'll see who wants to um, join us for general discussion. Now, yesterday, the group was, we, we decided was manageable to do it all in one. And then we took questions using raising a hand in the participants facility and actually being able to speak to one another and voice, voice your own question. So I think we'll see if we can do that again. Oh, I've just now seen uh, another question. Um, would it be fair to say that these verses are felt by the commentators to be difficult verses, hence the attempt to limit their application to narrow contexts? Um, point one, they don't say so. Um, and in terms of early commentators, I'm reluctant to try to get into their minds. Point two, I wouldn't necessarily think so. It might be that these interpretations seem relatively self-evident uh, and they, they recur in some other verses as well, not just the ones that I've mentioned. So on the other hand, clearly there's, an, there's a need to harmonize their understanding, if you like, um, at points. Um, so in other words, not affirming scriptures which seem to go against the Quran. How can the Quran be affirming something which it also differs from in certain ways? At least that would be the perception. So their responses would be a way of making sense of that. Um, someone's just asking for my email. The easiest way perhaps is to say it's on the CMCS Oxford website uh, under my page. Anyone's welcome to uh, find it there. I can, I can pop it in the chat, but I suggest that we now uh, take our break and reconvene at quarter past for a more broad ranging discussion. Great. Thanks very much. See you soon, I hope.